1 Samuel chapter 29. It's a very short chapter. We see as we get to the end of this particular book, the chapters tend to get short. The next one, chapter 30, is kind of long. And then the last chapter in this book, 31, is also very short. So I haven't yet made up my mind whether we have one or two weeks left in this particular book after tonight. But we are certainly nearing the end of this saga of David, who has been anointed king, yet to be crowned king. And uh, now we know that we've kind of discovered David right there in the belly of the beast, so to speak, in Philistia. He's serving under Achish, the king of Gath. And now this war, which has been brewing for a couple of chapters, is just about to come to a head. So we have Israel uh, in, their, in their array, military array. We have the Philistines in their military array. And we have this small little episode before the battle actually commences about King, uh, well, yet to be King David as he comes to line himself up with the Philistines. Let's read this together. 1 Samuel 29, verse 1 and onward. Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. Then the princes of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, Is, not, is this not David the servant of Saul the king of Israel, who has been with me these days or these years? And to this day I found no fault in him, since he defected to me. But the princes of the Philistines were angry with him, so the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return, that he may go back to the place which you have pointed for him, appointed for him, and do not let him go down with us to the battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with what could he reconcile himself to his master, if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sang to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright, and you're going out, and you're coming in with me, in the army is good in my sight. For to this day I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Therefore, return now, and go in peace that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, but what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I have been with you that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said he shall not go up with us to the battle. Now therefore, rise early in the morning with, with your master's servants who have come with you, and as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So this is, this is now, if you will, just hours before this immense battle will happen, take place. And of course, spoiler alert, we know how this ends. Israel will be soundly routed and defeated by the Philistines and Saul and his sons and his armor bearer will be killed. But this curious episode now has been brought to our attention in inspired scripture that we should understand that at least up until this point, David had kept the facade going, that he had truly defected from all Israel. He had come to support the Philistines and to serve Achish in Gath. And he even marches out to be with them in the army. It's very bizarre. And it's kind of hard to work out. What's David after in this? What does David want? Who's right in this, this debate between Achish, who is a king over the city of Gath? But you remember, we've studied this before. The Philistines was a, was a, a loose alliance of five major Philistine cities. And each of these cities were their own somewhat. They had their own autonomy and independence. And so Achish was one, and the other four princes, or they're called lords, or other times they're called kings, they were not on board with David being there with them in the battle. And it makes a lot of sense. Why would they? 
Why would they? They're starting to get their, their armies together. They're starting to march against Israel, the Hebrews. And they look around and there is 600 formidable fighting men of the Hebrews marching right up in the back. And they say, this doesn't quite seem to fit. There's something wrong with this picture. This doesn't seem like the most safe situation we can be in. And Achish tries to defend David. And we can see that Achish has been duped. We know that David hasn't been all that he's presented himself to be. We know that David has used deceit and, and, and mischief to, uh, to actually deceive Achish. Remember, David's been planted in Ziklag, and he's been going out on these spoiling raids against mutual enemies of the Philistines and the Israelites. And the whole time he has done this, he keeps telling Achish, the king of Gath, Oh, no, 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 I am, I'm raiding Hebrew cities. That's what I've been doing. So Achish has this overly, overly optimistic picture of David. He's been conned. By David. It doesn't, it doesn't quite sit right, does it? It doesn't feel right. But it helps us to draw some conclusion as to what is David's intention here, lining up in battle with the Philistines. Are his intentions good? Are they noble? Are, they, are, are his intentions there to serve the Philistines? Or is this when David makes his great break with the Philistines? Are the other princes of the Philistines actually right? You see, they smell a rat. And they are right to smell a rat. They are not nearly as gullible as Akish seems to be. And then we see again, as we've studied this in past weeks in our series, we see this blasted song reappear. And we spoke about this song before. This song has caused David nothing but trouble. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. Every single time in this particular historical account, that song rears its ugly head. It spells the downfall of David. When that song first appeared, it actually caused the fracturing of the relationship between Saul and David. They were best of friends. Saul called David he's like his own son, and then the people started to sing the song. Saul and David went their separate ways. Saul tried to kill David. The next time this song reared its ugly head in the history of the narrative is when David actually went first to the Philistines. Before this time, David initially tried to join the Philistines, you remember? And Achish wasn't so sure. David had to feign madness and spat on himself and acted like a, a right fool and Achish dismissed him from his presence. And now this song appears again. I touched on this last week, but we, we need to be reminded of this. Be ever so suspicious of the praises of men. We, we, all of us, this is universal. This is the human experience. None of us are nearly as wary as we should be when other people praise us. You know, when other people praise us, we have this natural inclination to feel like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds kind of right. That sounds kind of accurate. That sounds like, that sounds like how I should be spoken of. I, I should be uplifted and celebrated and, and made much of. Be ever so suspicious when others praise you. As David ought to have been when this song first ever appeared in the history of David's life, he should have tried everything he could to stamp this out. It's a snare indeed. In fact, the praises of men is worthless. It's worse than worthless. It's a snare this little jingle had caused David nothing but trouble. All of David's woes, in fact, can be traced back to this little song being sung and danced through at some point in David's history. From the moment its tune was first struck, David's relationship with Saul was broken. Until this instance now, when David tries, we might assume, to infiltrate the Philistine camp. And what does he hear? But that song reiterated again. This, is, this tune has now become David's marching orders to be expelled from the camp of the Philistines. And here's the truth of it. I will bet, and I'm speculating, but I will bet on this, that when David first heard this song, I think he, I think he gave quite a wry smile about it. When David first heard this song, I think he might have been a little bit pleased about it. I think when David came back from battle... And he heard them singing this song. I think he thought, well, it's not half untrue. 
Saul is a great warrior. Saul has slain his thousands. But me, David, I know that my, my head count is greater than Saul's. I know I'm a, I'm a greater warrior. You can see that David must have been somewhat pleased, giving him the warm and fuzzies. But I bet at this stage, again, we're, we're speculating a little here, but, but play along with me if you will. I will bet at this stage in David's life, there is no sound more odious to him than this song. I will bet it. When he first heard it, he was like, oh, I kind of like that. I'll make that my ringtone. I don't mind that. That's kind of cool. Now David hears it again and he thinks that blasted song has caused me nothing but trouble. Be very suspicious of the praises of men. Oh, that we were better at feeling the last sensation than the first. David probably rude this experience that the reality is now at this juncture in his life, he's hearing this song again and it's spoiling his plans again and David must have regretted that he didn't feel this kind of frustration at the song when he first heard it. Who knows? Maybe David encouraged it. We can't tell for sure, but now we can see the effects of the praises of men. Let me put it this way. If your name has been put into a song, you are in very serious trouble indeed. Now maybe very few of us will ever be at quite that level of risk. But when others praise you, you should at least have some degree of suspicion. Now I'm not saying feign, feign that fake and false modesty and humility where it's, don't praise me, don't, don't lord me, it's, it's all to Jesus. That, that certainly gets overly saccharine and bothersome in Christian circles. But when others praise you, at least inwardly guard your heart. It's rarely all that it's made out to be. We see this in the life of David. And even more than that, what we can see from this account is although these are David's plans frustrated, and indeed it is, we speculate what David's plans may have been. We don't know for sure. But in fact, David was cut loose just in the nick of time. Cut loose from the Philistine camp just in the nick of time. Not only must we develop a keener sense of suspicion when we are lavish with man's praise, we must do that, but this chapter encourages us to have a better trust and appreciation in the providence of God. It's kind of a technical theological phrase, isn't it? The providence of God. When God, moving in and through our life by ordinary means, so governs our life for His glory and our good. That's what we mean by the providence of God. That God's sovereign dispensation of rule over our life will always ultimately tend to His greatest glory and our greatest good. And there are times in life where that is simply hard to trust. We know the promise of Romans 8.28 that all things will work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And part of the, part of the way that we ensnare ourselves is we misunderstand the verse and we, we treat it as though it's supposed to say all things in and of themselves are good and that's not at all what God promises. There are a lot of things in life that are actually bad. They're negative experiences. They're tumultuous or painful or, or downright traumatic. But the promise of God in His providence is sure. We must develop a trust in the providence of God. As I've said now two or three times in our study of this short chapter, we don't exactly know what David's intentions were. What were his plans? He's now a mercenary, mercenary under Achish. But the most likely scenario, as I've already argued, is that he will turn against the Philistines. Once the battle heats up, he will work a victory for his countrymen from the inside. But maybe not. There is a chance that that's actually not how we should interpret this. That David was so fed up with Saul and Israel. You remember when David was in the wilderness of Israel and Judah trying to escape Saul? And every time David and his men found a place to camp out, the locals would just out him and tell Saul where he is. Maybe David is just, he's just had enough and he's ready to go to war against them and, and win. Maybe. We don't know. We're not sure. But what we can see in the text is David is severely disappointed, bitterly disappointed. That's clear. That's clear. Akish comes to David 
and says to David, I'm sorry, man, but the other princes of the Philistines don't want you here. You've got to pack up your stuff, pack up your men, and go back to Ziklag. You're not welcome and you're not wanted. And David begins to defend himself. You remember in the chapter, David begins to, begins to declare his innocence. And there's, there's a level of dishonesty to that, isn't there? Achish's opinion of David is far too optimistic. But David is bitterly disappointed about being told to pack up his tents and men and leave the battlefront. I find that when we're thinking about the providence of God, there are few historic resources quite so quite so poignant, quite so helpful, quite so piercing as the old hymn from William Cowper. Some of you know it well. In fact, I, I wrote it out just to read for us to meditate on the providence of God. And some of you could very well stand up and recite this verbatim. And others will recognize that once we enter into the first few lines, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage, take the clouds ye so much dread, are big with mercy and shall break in blessings upon your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he... Anybody? hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet shall be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan God's work in vain. God is His own interpreter and He will make it plain. And why go on? Why go on at length about the divine providence of God? Because on the one hand, what is really clear and explicit in this story is David did have a plan for being infiltrated so deeply in the Philistine camp, but his plans were utterly thwarted. And out of frustration, David and his men wake up the next day, pack up their tents, pull their armor together, and begin the long march home to Ziklag. It's a two-day journey back. And we know it. Well, maybe you don't know, but the very next chapter opens with this grim scene that on encountering Ziklag, David and his men see nothing but plumes of smoke pouring upward from the smoldering ash as the Amalekites had utterly razed the city to the ground and raided it entirely. What providence? David had a plan, did he not? David had, David had this whole idea about he, how he was going to fight in this war and bring a victory. We don't exactly know which side David was fighting for, but he had a plan. David's plans were frustrated. And David and his men return and find Ziklag an utter ruin. Desolation. In fact, it was so bad, we're going to read this next week in, in the next chapter of 1 Samuel, but... But here's the insight. It was so bad that David's men seriously consider stoning him. These men. This is the first act in all of Scripture we ever read about these 600 men of David who ever seriously consider a seditious act. They were just about to fight for the Philistines against their own countrymen, such as their loyalty to David. But so graphic... So jarring is the sight of Ziklag that these men begin to think that their only recourse is to kill David on the spot. This is staggering. The scenario before us is staggering. But if there's any good news out of the sacking of Ziklag by the Amalekites, is that the women and the children were dragged off as slaves. And David has arrived just in time to arm 400 of his men in pursuit to destroy this enemy and recover the lives of their lives. I look at this story and we see this page after page in Scripture. The perfect providential sovereignty of a holy God. And we know this. 
And we let ourselves get so frustrated and so disappointed and, and, and so we, we just get in such a tears over how our plans don't always work out the way that we thought they would. And God shows us time and time in Scripture and even in experience that His ways are better than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. We must trust the providence of God. If David had stayed there in the Philistines, if David had convinced Achish, and then Achish went back to the princes of the Philistines and convinced them, look, uh, David's a good guy. Let him stay. He, he promises to fight the Hebrews and get a victory for us. And he's 600 men. They're brilliant. You should see these guys. They can each handle 100 men by themselves. They're tremendously well-equipped warriors. And David was able to stay. David and his men would never have seen their wives or children again. Ever. How many of us could testify to similar circumstances? Of course, not nearly or probably not nearly as graphic as this. But how many times were our plans thwarted only a day or a month or a year later or sometimes years after the fact to realize what God was doing all along was far greater, far better, far more glorious for Him and far more sanctifying for us. I think these are the two most poignant lessons of this chapter before us. Firstly, develop a sincere and deeply abiding suspicion of the praise of men. Worry only about what God thinks of you and care little about what others say. And secondly, develop an abiding trust in the providence of God. Your plans may be frustrated, but God's plans never will. Let's bow our head and close our eyes in this, in this church this evening as we meditate upon these glorious truths before us. As this saga begins to draw itself to an end right before our eyes. of David, the Philistines, Saul, and Israel, and the kingdom of Almighty God. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to gather around your word. And Father, we pray that you would teach us well by your spirit, through your word, how then we ought to live. How does the life of Christ manifest itself in our lives? How can we meditate upon our good and glorious Savior Jesus and imitate His ways? Father, help us to live lives of sanctification, deeply suspicious and wary of the praise of men, concerned chiefly, Lord God, with Your thoughts toward us. And help us, Lord, to always trust Your providence. A thousand times over, our plans can be frustrated, Lord God, but our trust is in You. You know it all, Lord God. You know tomorrow. You know yesterday perfectly. You understand all the events. Lord God, our plans are futile, and yet we trust ourselves to You. Help us, Lord God, to study these lessons well and to live out their implications in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 